Hello, time for a happy video. Hello world, I'm doing my best, the best, it's never been done for it. And I'm not even gonna mark this one up with the text. I'm in San Francisco, I've been homeless for 618 days, coast to coast. It's a little bit ridiculous. And I'm right beside the homeless shelter. This video is gonna be abruptly titled something like, The Acosta Family Dealing With Rita Being a Bitch, or was it the other way around? And specifically, I'm here at the homeless shelter in San Francisco. It's a beautiful homeless shelter. Look at it, it's pretty. The homeless shelter standards, this is a beautiful one. People in there care, they're nice to me. We are getting along. And specifically, like in my present day, I'm not really leaving the homeless shelter very much. There's not a reason to. I'm 16 times more likely to die. I can't just get up, prance back into a job. I have to wait for a California driver's license. Right now, today, I'm not leaving it because a case manager's helping another homeless person, but when he gets back, he's gonna help me get an Uber so I can go do a housing assessment. It's true, I had six case managers, and for over all the year I was fighting homelessness in Denver, I just got called, I was in the top five. I was about to get called. I was in the top five for housing, and I was also close to defeating homelessness through my own means, by working. That never worked out. There's other videos explaining that. Basically, somebody decided you can't stay here even though I said you could. So as you're clocking out and leaving, if you come back here and stay, I'm gonna have a random sleepover. Not with the married man I'm sleeping with, but with someone else. So me and the man of my dreams, we just left Colorado. Never burned his house down. That's it in a nutshell. And I'm just doing the best thing I can do. Staying by the homeless shelter, not going on any little adventures that can get me killed. I've got nowhere else to eat. It just makes sense to stay here at the homeless shelter and do my video. So I'm doing another one. Let's get into um, what am I doing here? So I'm fighting homelessness and fighting for all this right for all of my family. Part of that includes on the fighting for all this right for all of my family part. This information can be said that it's helpful for the family that might not exist yet. My brother, I've got one, Drew. He's real shitty. Drew, it could be, I passed away of homelessness. And down the line, as the years go on, somebody, a female is like, you know what? I wanna marry Drew. I wanna find out everything about what happened to his brother Nathan and watch his videos because I think I'm gonna have kids with Drew. And this information might be helpful then to her and to them kids that I'll never see. It also might be helpful, just in other ways we don't know yet, but it's good to show, I know, and I'm preserving the facts. I'm not gonna make any new ones. We're just kinda go over the ones we didn't know, that I knew, that Rita knows, we used to know, for she married Saudi Arabian arms dealer, forgot what yesterday was, or tomorrow, or the next five minutes. And we're just going to, you know, remember my dad's sleeping with a seven-year-old boy. It's incredibly wrong. We can't find anybody to help with that. And I decided to not kill Tom Acosta when I was in the woods with him. Just like I decided to not burn Josh Eves' house down. And he said I couldn't stay there so he could have a random sleepover with some other slut. So, all that being said, you can just get to a point on your 618th day homeless where you're like, we should do these facts. So... From about 1972 to October 1998, when chunky butt Sarah Stevens, the divorce attorney and chief politician of Mount Airy's, America's number one TV hometown, Mount Airy, North Carolina, my hometown, inspiration behind Andy Griffith Show, we have a divorce attorney for over 16 years, chunky butt Sarah Stevens, who I believe now is even real pretty, being morbidly obese and bald headed and the chief politician of my hometown and a divorce attorney all at the same time. So, before Sarah Stevens kind of got paid, what a house got paid to split my family in half and put me at a 38% likelihood for always being homeless, all these facts happened. And then they continued in a way from October 1998 until September 2008, when Drew Acosta turned 18 and the sheriff's deputies that were basically guarding the demilitarized zone in America that was my mother's driveway because my parents could not unchaperone peacefully change custody, me and my brother, and I already went to college. So Drew was still doing this until September 2008. 
allegedly. So that's basically what you should know. During this time though, from like 1972 to October 1998, basically most people should agree with us, who know, who were there. The Acosta family considered my mom to be a bitch. But I kind of look at it like, eh, I kind of see it the other way around. Like y'all are both a bitch to each other. So much. But let's just go through, I want to go through like, I generally feel like the Acosta family, because it's more of them, was generally more of a bitch to my mother. And I usually stand by my mother on a lot of these cases. But, things happen. Um, like for example, like around the time I was born, my mom got into it with Fanny, the queen mother at the time, my dad's mom. It got really explosive and real mean. I don't think they ever really made up. It was bad. Um, other things I want to say in this video. Well, my mom did have an ally in Uncle George. And it's true, I have two of my eldest uncles on each side, one of Uncle George on that dad's side, and Uncle Bob on my mother's side. We're both homeless, the eldest siblings in their family like I am, and both died prematurely. Uncle George died of cancer, Uncle Bob died after firing a shotgun and blowing his brains out. Very sad. We still have not uh, got any answers on that since like 1996, and we probably never will because when the boomers in my family do stupid stuff, there's usually some bad secrets around that to probably, we'll never know. We just had an experience learning history about my Aunt Nora on my mom's side and my Uncle Mike on my dad's side. Those two were not married. So they never slept together and they definitely did. But while that was going on, basically the rest of the Costas were being a bitch to my mom. She did have an ally in Uncle George. Uncle George and Aunt, my mom, Rita Kay, liked each other. And he's my dad's half-brother, um, Fanny's son, with Mr. Blankenship, generic, half-grandpa I have, I guess, kind of. Um, but he died in 95 cancer. During the 90s, there was clashes always between my mother and all the rest of the classes. They just never, ever got along. There are sometimes... Uncle Angelo is someone my mother never got along with. It's someone I really never have got along with very much until my dad had that quadruple open heart bypass in 2019. And then I was like with Uncle Angelo, we were watching TV and having pizza. And we were like having for the first time, we were having like nephew uncle time. And I remember telling my dad, if you didn't make it out of that open heart surgery, I was gonna go live with Uncle Angelo. And he blurted out because open heart surgeries, I think, do this. He blurted out, wow, Uncle Angelo hates your ass. And I was like, you would have never said that. But he did. And now he's sleeping with a seven-year-old boy. So, you know, Tom Acosta is an atomic bomb. But back in the 90s, Uncle Angelo and my mom hated each other. And I have said in another video, Uncle Angelo is the second sorriest thing I've ever seen in my life. The first sorriest thing you've ever seen in my life is Tom Acosta because he's sleeping with a seven-year-old boy. But Uncle Angelo generally earned that title the second sorriest thing you've ever seen in my life. My mother, up until 2021, when she said she couldn't remember anything before 2020, would have always agreed with that statement. But Uncle Angelo, the only time he was not like in combative mode with my mother, would have been at funerals. Uncle Angelo has this weird Magical ability, only at funerals and only in the 90s. I've never seen it happen after the 90s. Cause we haven't had, it. we had Uncle Mike's funeral. I wasn't there cause I was fighting homelessness by being at the hospital so I could get a hospital transport to Charleston to escape my dad's house where there was no water and all like a red flag factory. After he had so I left Denver last winter, winter before last, went back to West Virginia. Me and my dad were in this weird cabin. My dad was like, I'm gonna leave you here in this cabin to go sleep with a seven-year-old boy. And that's when I was like, oh, what's wrong? And we're here in the woods and he would come back after sleeping with a seven-year-old and I'd be like, I might have to kill him right here in the woods. And my dad was just like, let's just, I never told him that. 
my dad was just like, throughout history, my dad's always been like, I need to work on my art projects, which means I need creative freedom. So why don't we do something with you? My dad's a little delicate diva. So um, I agreed to go back to the house that was for sale, the 6,000 square foot house, the largest home in America, and the poorest place in America where he made me homeless in 2016. I agreed to go back there, not knowing there wasn't any water on and there would never be any water on. I thought that that problem would get fixed. I thought I'd be there with people that I knew prior to coming to, back to Denver, prior to getting promoted to Denver in 2019. I thought I would be at the house in a better situation. It turned out to not be the case, but Uncle Angelo in the 90s had this ability to have, be like an explosion of cares at funerals. Like, there was a time my mom and Angela were holding on to each other at a funeral. I was like, this is weird. But overall, that only happens at funerals, and it's only happened in the 90s. And he can still do that. He could just turn into explosion of cares right now. Nobody has to die. He could just be like, I care like I do at funerals in the 90s. And we're going to make everything better and make everybody feel better. And we're just kind of like... It would be great if Uncle Angelo had that ability. We could start him up like the Rolling Stones. But he's in Myrtle Beach, not caring about me or his wives or his children or anything at all. So Uncle Angelo sucks. But, um, and he hates my ass, according to Dad. So we already know that. Um, but, like, there was always tension between, like, Donna plans like back she like is the aunt that plays backup you know she's kind of like the beta level aunt she washes dishes and she eats a lot of snacks washes dishes and eats more snacks it's kind of like all you need to know about donna and aunt maddie is more of the premier alpha level aunt she's the one that's thin and pretty and the best friends with divorce attorney chunky butt sarah stevens who was my mom's first divorce attorney why she's best friends with Maddie. Only reason I can't explain, Aunt Maddie cares about conservative politics. She's the divorce attorney, chief politician. They go to the bathroom together at Walmart and Trump rallies. They probably go to the bathroom together if Sarah can fit in the bathrooms there. That's just kind of what they do. They're best friends. They go to the bathroom a lot together. They're real shitty people. They don't care about Nathan, but Maddie was probably one that my mom got along with more. And she, in 2020, when we were in Washington, D.C., last time I saw my mom, my mom was still like, how's Maddie? She still knew who she was. And I was like, well, she's still friends with your divorce attorney. And she was like, well, besides that. And I was like, well, that's basically all you need to know, mom. And she still cared about Aunt Maddie. But... Like, Uncle Mike and my mom. More so on my mom's end. When I was in, like, it, when, it, like, when Lion King came out in 94, my mom, we were watching the Lion King on tape. Didn't it come out with, like, a green tape? Like, the Harriet the Spy movie came out in an orange tape. I think Lion King came out in, like, a green or a blue tape, right? So we were watching that tape. And <laughs> my mom looked at us and was like, your uncle, Mike, is like Uncle Scar. And that hurt Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike later, you know, before or later, they had that sleepover with Aunt Nora. And, uh, which was so wrong because he was married to Aunt Teresa. Not Nora. Not at all. He was also married to Aunt Kay, who I think has a right to be pissed about that. And he was married to Aunt Phyllis. And so, Aunt Nora, shame on you. Forever. All the time. We're still waiting on Aunt Nora's DVD, exercise DVD, jumping jacks with baggy clothes on in our 60s. I don't think we're ever gonna get it, get it, but we should be hoping for the best. She needs to be Emmy nominated, since my dad was. A stupid documentary about poverty, where the documentary filmmaker is gonna wasted $150,000 to do a documentary about poverty, didn't spend a dime on lodging because she stayed at my dad's house. And then that documentary called Hollow got Emmy nominated, my dad's in it. And it got screened at U.S. Capitol. Then my dad may be homeless from the same damn home. Here I am in San Francisco, staying by this beautiful homeless shelter. Not really able to move forward with life. 
but I can tell you these facts. So, um, my mom cared about Maddie, and the only time I really remember my Maddie cared about my mom would have been in like 1997. No, 1998, 1999. Madonna was on the radio with like the Austin Powers soundtrack and that beautiful Stranger song. And I feel like I just got home. And I was like, oh, I ain't never going home again with mom and dad. <laughs> Chunky Butt Sarah Stevens just made that happen. But we were in Washington, D.C. with Maddie and this brand new minivan. Because M Maddie loves to buy vehicles off the showroom floor. She's very high stylish. And we were in this green minivan, this Dodge minivan with doors on both sides. Remember, like, that was a big new thing. And so Maddie had to have the big new thing. We were in this minivan with, like, this, you know, Nokia cell phone that was, like, a brick. And, you know, calling Uncle Sam for J Joe and Samantha to call their dad. And all of a sudden, as soon as that call was over, probably because that Maddie was like, we're riding around here in the nation's capital in this big old brand new green minivan with doors on both sides with my big old Nokia cell phone. Kyle and Uncle Sam driving down the interstate. Tommy, them boys needed to talk to their kids. And Tom was like, it's expensive, Maddie. And she was like, I don't care. Because Maddie clearly, she doesn't care about money. Tell her she doesn't have any. Because <laughs> Uncle Sam died money ran out in 2006. But this is like 1998. We were still highballing on Uncle Sam's coal miner money. He retired from because he's a lot older. Anyway, um, we call my mom on that cell phone for like three minutes. But we did call her and Maddie was like, the boys need to talk to their mother. So, you know, she's best friends with a divorce attorney still today. They went to Trump rallies. I'm pretty sure they're still friends. And just shady people. But clearly they are. I just emailed Sarah Stevens the other day about, I'm homeless, you should help, and she ain't helping. So, Maddie, also clearly very much a shitty person. Um, knows I'm homeless. Knew I was homeless back in 2016. Never did shit about it. Neither did my mom. The boomers boom out. And then we smoke them out of their holes. Anyway, um, my mom did like Uncle Sam. So there was a time in 2006. She liked Uncle Sam in general all the time. And Uncle Sam was very much a non-combative, peaceful, elder, a gentle leader. He was the leader of this family when this family was divorcing itself. When Chucky Butt Sarah Stevens was getting paid what a home cost to put me at a 38% likelihood of being homeless. And then she became the number one chief politician of America's TV hometown. And just going down in history as being obese and bald-headed and a mean old bitch. But before that happened, when we were getting divorced the first time, my mom got divorced again in Saudi Arabia. Whole other situation. But when we were getting divorced in Surrey County, Uncle Sam was the one that came, like as a representative of McDowell County. And he was like, I'm gonna go down there and help Nathan tie his tie at divorce court. And then we went to a piano recital, but he was also there. It was like, I'm gonna make sure that big old divorce attorney don't get out of line. And I loved Uncle Sam. My mom loved Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam's birth Uncle Sam's birthday, December 18th. Remember that? We went to a bowling alley for one of his birthdays. Right before we got divorced. Mom was there. Anyway, um in 2006, Uncle Sam comes down with lung cancer, real bad. And he's in the hospital. My mom worked at the hospital before she was permanently terminated for stealing ICU crash cart meds. And I got a toxicology report. And that's why I moved to West Virginia. And I left West Virginia altogether five times. That was my 20s and 30s. And now I'm spending 15% of my 30s over that, fighting homelessness and for all that's right for my family. The family that's going to be better because it's not here yet. The family I love, because it's the family that's the gay family I've owned. Anyway, here we are in busy San Francisco, just showering and everything. But Uncle Sam came down with cancer. This was before my mom got permanently terminated. And it was 2006, and she opens the elevator doors, and there they are. It's the team of Costas coming in to care and love on their loved one. It's never homeless. 
probably would have never allowed me to be homeless, but it's Uncle Sam and he's dying of cancer. My mom sees them and she puts the best of her nursing into Uncle Sam. She is just like there, like, like we never got divorced. She is just like, the costs are hurting. And it was just a time when Rita was really being that 1994 mother again. That mother was like, I don't care what happened. I love Uncle Sam. You guys are awful, but it's Uncle Sam. I'm gonna do the best. And she did. She'd come back and she would tell us all about how she took care of Uncle Sam and dealt with Donna and all that. But like, she did, she cared about. There was also a whole other time in like 2017. This is after my dad had made me homeless and we're over at Donna's. We had already got back from going to Fifth Avenue to help Tom Acosta accomplish his stupid bougie boomer dream of pursuing art gallery representation at Fifth Avenue, which he only got there because of me. Aunt Maddie can't do that stuff. Uncle Mike can't do that stuff. Uncle Angelo can't do that stuff. Only that happens when me and my dad work together. This is never gonna happen again. Cause he went to January 6th. I quit working for him after that. But also because he's a child molester, I don't work for child molesters. Not gonna start, never have, ain't gonna happen. So dads, awful. But um, we were like coming back from, you know, Fifth Avenue and coming back from like the same time we had just given Senator Joe Manchin. United States Senators on the Armed Services Committee and the Veterans Affairs Committee and represents right now West Virginia where my dad was paid to complete a mural honoring Vietnam veterans and he started it indoors in Welch, West Virginia. Home of the oldest Veterans Day Parade in U.S. history. So before becoming a child molester, he took the money. Should probably get a prison for that. Joe Manchin should know about all of this information, but he has a portrait of my Uncle Mike and has had it since weeks after I defeated the homelessness. Uncle Mike helped corroborate and helped gear up my dad to make me homeless. <laughs> Uncle Mike is only a state treasurer as long as I say he is. So right now, for all the facts we know about Uncle Mike, he's still a state treasurer. That could change. Uncle Mike had a long life. I don't know all of it. We need to talk to Kay Acosta, if she's still around. Phyllis loved him very much. I was there when Phyllis died, but Uncle Mike had a long life. We know about this sleepover with Nora. If he had some other indecent sleepovers, it is possible, totally possible. We don't know the full history on our state treasurer, Uncle Mike, but we know that he's been with Senator Joe Manchin in canvas form uh, just our defeated homelessness. Senator Manchin also can't call me back. He's got a weird close affiliation with my dad, just like the governor of West Virginia, Jim Justice, who governs with the dog's butthole at multiple state sponsored events. But getting back to this event in 2017. So my mom at this point is like living her best life in Switzerland. I had already transported, uh, there's that picture of just my mom's headboard. The whole bed is missing, but in 2016, the spring before my dad made me homeless from the largest home in America and the poorest place in America, weird around with the Salem at a storage unit, me and my brother and his girlfriend and Richard, the Saudi Arabian arms dealer and my mom, this weird, stupid cast of people, we're down here at the storage unit and we're emptying everything out and put it in U-Haul. And that's when my bro brother Drew is like a big diva. And it's like, I'm not helping Nathan transport all this stuff to dad's house. Cause my mom didn't want it. She wanted to hold on to it, but she didn't want to pay for it. And my dad was like, I got a big house. You can just put it here. And so that's when I had to transport all of my mom's belongings and me and my dad, the Tom Lester, who was strong still at the time, had to unload the truck. So Drew being a diva, could just not even do it. But six months later, my dad meets me homeless. But this is like a year later, about a year after I take my mom's whole entire bed, which was only there in the headboard form, like the red flag factory my dad's house is, and just so many fucked up things about my dad's house in 2023. But in 2017, we had just defeated homelessness. We had just been on these long drives to New York City and take this painting of Uncle Mike to Senator Manchin's house, but we stopped by at Donna's 
And we're there at Aunt Donna's, and Aunt Donna's sad, because she always is. But we were there, <laughs> she's extra sad, because her son Josiah, who's always been fat, had, you know, um, been a burden on aircraft across the ocean after the Trump election, and was in Sweden. And he was in Sweden, being a burden to people in Sweden. He was talking, no, he wasn't, not really. Josiah was there, um, and he's supposed to be working in the Christian music industry. You would think that like some of those Christian values would just kind of rub off, and he'd be like, let's help Nathan. But no, Josiah was, I'll tell you, since we're talking about him, the only person besides my brother for like five minutes on January 6th who was like, your dad going to January 6th is wrong. He was the only one, and then he changed his mind in like 10 minutes. But back in 2017, after being a burden aircraft and landing safely in Sweden, Josiah was walking down the street, really probably just talking to his girlfriend on the phone. I think that's what he was doing. According to Donna, that's what was going on. He was walking down the street, and he got jumped by people in Sweden who only jumped him because he was an American with an American accent. They didn't like Donald Trump, so they were like, Josiah's gonna take one for the team. And they beat the shit out of him. Next what happened, I called my mom, or somehow I, I did tell my mom about this, right away, because she's in Switzerland. They're not too far away, it's like South Carolina and South Dakota, right? And so, <laughs> my mom, instantly, this is like almost 20 years after October 1998, my mom turns into this, like, like kind of like angel at a funeral. She turns into this fireball of tears. And she's like, you tell Aunt Donna right now, I will get to Sweden and go save him and hug him and help him. Now, I'd already been made homeless. She had already complained to me, like in Egypt, about me being homeless, that her ex-husband, the love of her life, caused while I was doing a Christmas card. And Uncle Mike was, like, still in cash to my crack. <laughs> That's what happened. So I tell Aunt Donna, Aunt Donna, Rita's in Switzerland and she cares about Josiah so much right now. She is willing to help in any way. And it turned out to where Donna was like, thanks, I appreciate it, but you know, Rita's a bitch, I don't want her to, or something like that happened. So Rita, it, the message was made to Josiah and the family declined. And then Josiah, obese and had the shit beat out of him, just got on another aircraft, burdened it as it managed to get across the ocean with his big ass and it landed safely in Tennessee and then he just went back to the comfort and safety of his own home. True story. So that's like 28 minutes and more of like the Acostas dealing with my mom. There's probably some other facts I left out but basically you should know these two sides talk like most of the time and were horrible to my mother. And then when she drops out of the picture, basically in October 1998, because after that, until September 2008, she's really only there in like the um, comfort and security of her own home. And my dad's in the driveway and there's sheriff's deputies. And me and my brother are like, you know, having to walk and be, you know, monitored. Cause this is a demil demilitarized zone. My stepdad stays there. And like, there's all these like other boomers that could like, you know, Uncle Tim had to come, Donna's husband had to come, and then he couldn't handle it. Donna and Maddie, they were never tough enough to handle the custody exchange. There was this whole time, I'm gonna put fit this in here before we get to 30 minutes. There was this whole time, because my dad would pick us up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We moved around 2000. So most of this custody exchange crap happened in Winston-Salem. And then we would drive across two state lines to wherever it was best for my dad. Not for us kids, but best for my dad because his name was already shit all over North Carolina. Um, that we had to have custody, you know, we get off on a Friday after school, we spent four hours driving to West Virginia. And then on Sunday, we had to be back at 6 p.m. So we had four more hours of driving to do. That's what we did every other weekend throughout the 2000s. So one of these times, my brother's working on homework. And my dad's like, we are going to make sure, he had a big test or something. And my dad's like, we are going to make sure you get your homework done right here in the house. 
Nathan knows I have later. And we don't care. But, so that's what happened. My dad was doing right. Nate, Tom was right. He was like, we're going to make sure Tom, Drew is ready for his test. And we're going to sit here. And so we got back to Winston-Salem late. Well, what does my mother do? Rita Kay decides to make us homeless. She refuses to let me and my brother back in the house. Now, guess what happened? I was over 16 at the time. My car that I had at Rita and Steve's was right there in the driveway. Of course, I'm 16. I've got the keys. Don't have much money. And I had a cell phone. Guess what happened? My dad drops us off. Didn't even stay. There weren't sheriff's deputies there that night. Well, maybe there was, they were earlier, but they weren't because we got there late, right? So my mom did not let us into the house. And she was like, you can just have to find another way because you didn't make it here on time. It was our fault that we didn't make it there on time because Drew had a test. My dad was like, you're going to learn how to study for this test in the comfort and security of your own stupid second home in West Virginia. So we get back to North Carolina. My mom refuses for us to access the home, our primary home. Back when I had two homes, couldn't even get into the one I'm supposed to get into. So I get in the vehicle that's mine and I get on the cell phone and like I race up and I catch up with dad. And then there's this whole week where I'm at West Side High School, but staying at Donna's in Surrey County. And it's this whole like deliberate, like Rita made us homeless. And Tom Acosta is having to like be the better parent for a little bit. And it's just like, that all happened. So I was already made homeless. This is technically kind of my third time homeless, but we just kind of grouped this as my second. But that happened. Sure did. Donna remembers that. That was like the only time me and Donna were like BFF. Me and Donna were watching Ever After with Drew Barrymore <laughs> and that hot prince. Remember Donna? <laughs> Doesn't look like Uncle Tim at all, but we were having the haunts of that prince. We had to believe in something and we believed in that movie. So there you go. That's kind of like a good rundown of how I grew up. And big special shout out to Aunt Maddie's best friend, chunky butt, bald-headed, obese, Sarah Stevens, the divorce attorney, is the number one chief politician of America's number one TV hometown, home of Andy Griffith Show and the old millennium, and home of all this shit now. Yeah. And I'm marking it up and I decided Here's why. Here's why. Because I can't give my mother any more credit than like you might assume she would get after she made me homeless because my brother was doing that homework. And I had to like help my brother survive. My brother's been homeless too for like four days, five days. We were going from like, we were driving all across North Carolina to get to school and do his test. I don't know how we did on tests. Probably not too good. But I want to tell you, so I had that cell phone in the car, right? Well, my mother, Rita K. back then, decided to turn the cell phone off. She deliberately called Nokia, or Singular. Remember Singular Wireless? That's what we had. She called Singular Wireless and was like, turn off Nathan's phone. Don't turn off my phone, but turn off Nathan's phone. She was so mad that I, who was up Tom Acosta, didn't get my brother back on time that she turned off the phone as I'm driving across like high school, picking up Drew from school, driving back across North Carolina to where we used to live. Yeah, that's what the bitch did, okay? She did that. Now, since I've had to include that, I'm gonna mark this video up and we'll do the fundraising links. If you can help, why not? I mean, it would be the right thing to do.